each one down at your feet every moment of my wandering never change as why you see I've tried to win this war I confess my hands are weary I need your rest mighty warrior king of the fight no matter what I face you by my side when you don't move the mountains I'm needing you to move when you don't part the waters I wish I could walk through when you don't give me answers as I cry out to you I will trust I will trust I will trust in you truth is you know what tomorrow brings there's not a day ahead you have not seen so in all things be my life and breath i want what you want lord and nothing less when you don't move the mountains i need you to move when you don't part the waters i wish i could walk through when you don't give me answers as i cry out to you i will trust i will trust i will trust in you i will trust in you you are my strength and comfort you are my steady hand you are my firm foundation the rock on which i stand your ways are always higher your plans are always good there's not a place where i'll go you've not already stood when you don't move the mountains i'm needing you to move Good morning. Good morning. Happy Mother's Day. Um, I want to say a special Happy Mother's Day to all the ladies here. Um, no matter what kind of role you play, there are lots of different roles you can play in people's lives. And um, the blessing that you are to others is um, truly a gift from God. And so we want to honor all of you this morning. 
Um, if you are new worshiping with us this morning, we're so glad that you are here. Um, there are cards on the seat backs in front of you if you'd like to fill one out so we can get to know you more. We would love to get to know you more. If you are uh, new worshiping with us online, you can click the new here tab. Um, there will be no young at heart this month. We're taking the month of May off, and then we will resume in June. So if you're looking for that information this month, wondering why you haven't seen that, that is why. Um, we have our worship night and food trucks on June 2nd. That will be a great uh, opportunity just for some fellowship. It is open to the community, so if you want to invite friends, family, coworkers, whoever, uh, we would love for this room to be filled. We would love to um, just worship God with a huge group of people lifting our voices together um, and also the fellowship with the food trucks beforehand. That is June 2nd um, from 5 to 7. The food trucks will be from 5 to 7 and then the worship night starts at 7 o'clock inside. Um, and then lastly, if you would like to worship through giving, you may do so. There are several options on the screen and they are also listed in your bulletin. I'm waiting on Joe. <laughs> Good morning. Um, I'm going to have my friends, the Vaccarellis, come on up. Where are you guys? Oh, right over there. There we go. Um, we, uh, it, it's been kind of a fun thing uh, over the past several weeks. Oh, actually, we might be waiting on it. We good? You're good. Oh, there we go. Hey, always an exciting time. That's right. <laughs> um, so over the past several weeks, you may have seen a lot of uh, new faces kind of showing up um, within the church uh, here worshiping with us, and we're really excited about that. We love seeing new people. We love meeting new people, and, and we also love when people um, are taking their next steps. And like I always tell everybody, no matter where you are in your walk with the Lord, there's always a next step we can take. And sometimes that next step is saying you want to um, make official where you're going to plug into a church and say, this is going to be my, my church and my people, and we're going to uh, serve and uh, worship together. And that's what my, my friends, uh, uh, Debbie and Bill Vaccarelli, come and uh, do that this morning here uh, with our church family. So um, good morning. Come on. <laughs> there you go. You're going to decide who gets to go first, right? Yeah. <laughs> I don't. Not, not most him. times I don't. That's right. So uh, this is Debbie and Bill Vaccarelli, um, and they, they are here this morning to place their membership officially with us, and we are just really excited about that. And if you got any of the uh, No Sugar Blueberry Muffins, I'm going to tell on you, okay. um, out in the foyer there, be, that you can thank this wonderful couple for them. They're the ones that made them. That's right. Thank you. Made sure to think of those who maybe uh, had to have sugar-free and things like that. Um, um, so be sure you come afterwards and thank them for the muffins. But even more importantly, be sure you come up afterwards and welcome them to the church family. Something that we always do as a church whenever folks come and place their membership is that we just share a confession of faith together as a church congregation. Whether you're a member or not a member, if you have faith in, in, in the Lord Jesus, we just share this together as a way of showing our unity and showing that we're together in this. And so so why don't we all just repeat after me? I believe, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the, Christ the, Son of the, living God, the Son of the living God, and the King of my life. And the King of my life. Amen. That's awesome. Let me pray for them real quick. Lord, I just thank you so much for this couple. I thank you for their love for you. I thank you for their desire to, to want to not just um, attend somewhere, not just be somewhere, but to really plug in and to be a part of a church family. And we're grateful that you have guided them here. Lord, may you continue to bless them as they grow in their relationship with you and bless them as they grow in their relationship together. And even as they grow as members here at Smithfield Christian Church, just bless us all together as we do our best to, to love like Jesus, to do our best to make a, a difference in people's lives. Um, it's in Jesus' name that I pray all these things. Amen. Amen. Thank you, friends. Yeah. Guys, we're going to continue our worship service. If you're going to stand with us. Um, before we do, uh, go into our next song. I, I just wanted to tell everybody, you know, happy Mother's Day. But also, um, you know, last week whenever I was in the hospital, um, you know, I'm a firm believer in the power of prayer. And I know there's a lot of folks in here praying for me, and I really appreciate it, man. Um, so just thank you very much. I know we got to pray in church. And, uh, and the power of prayer is really powerful. So please, anybody that's on our prayer list, y'all lift them up because y'all did an amazing job. So 
God bless. Amen. Amen. One, two. From the dawn of creation, this world has been crying out for to save us we long for the supernatural there is only one God who can save the day so clear the stage prepare the way as heaven and earth are singing glory hallelujah let the whole world see the greatness of
rang mountains and that stood in our way. But he came and he died and he rose. Those giants are dead now. Shine through 
Thank you so much for worshiping with us this morning. You can be seated. Thank you. Well, happy Mother's Day to everybody. This is one of, I was telling some people earlier, this is one of those holidays that like, you feel like you have to say it to everybody, right? It's like even to the guy, you're like, happy Mother's Day. I, I don't know why I'm saying this to you, but I feel like I'm supposed to. But Mother's Day, you know, like so many other holidays, there are so many things, maybe like little traditions built within them. Maybe you have some stuff you're going to do today with mom that maybe is like her favorite thing to do and you always do on Mother's Day. Maybe there's like a restaurant you always go to. Maybe there's a certain type of candy that she loves or certain type of flowers that she loves and you always get for Mother's Day. Um, we love to kind of do those things uh, for the ladies in our life, the moms in our lives. And we do the same thing, you know, for Father's Day. We'll have those special things that we'll, we'll celebrate in the same ways. Um, and even for all the other holidays. I mean, like the, the holidays where we commemorate special moments in our lives, birthdays, um, our Independence Day, Christmas, Easter, National Donut Day. I mean, these important days that you have to mark. And you know, the reason we have these things is that, that it kind of is important for us to mark those days. Because it's not like if we didn't have Mother's Day, well, we would never be thankful for our moms, right? It's not like if we never had Mother's Day, we wouldn't ever show our appreciation and our love to our moms. Of course we would. But it's important that we take time at certain times to kind of kind of mark it on a calendar and kind of pause and stop and do things in a different way. Um, and even though sometimes the plans that we have for those holidays, for those celebrations, sometimes they don't go exactly right. You know, moms, you probably, under, you probably know it all too well that it doesn't mean that the kids are going to be perfect on those days. It doesn't mean that the breakfast is going to be wonderful. It doesn't mean that, it's that the flowers actually made it home from the store or whatever. But all the intention is there, all the idea behind it, the love behind it. We have these things to remind us, and we stop and we pause for these holidays. And I know that we'll do that today. You'll do that. Maybe you've already done that a couple times today uh, for the moms in your life. Well, communion is another one of those reasons, another one of those things that we have. We don't have to have communion because we don't know any other way to thank God, right? I mean, we just sang these wonderful songs celebrating Him and asking Him to be with us and to, you know, to, to lead us and guide us. Of course, we're going to do those things, but communion is sort of another special way that, once again, we hit pause on things and we stop and we're reminded about what God did for us by sending His Son, Jesus, to this world to die in our place, to conquer sin and death, to raise to life, and to bring new life 
life for us. So this morning, um, if, you're, if you're new with us, we have our communion supplies, the little cups and the, and the bread are in the, the little cup holders in front of you. Feel free to grab those whenever. I'm going to pray in a little while, and then I'm going to give you some time to take the emblems on your own and also pray on your own. But when we do this, again, this isn't our one and only time that we stop and we pause and we remember what Jesus did for us. But this is an important time, a time for us to make, make special attention, give special attention to what Jesus has done. I want to read to you a scripture passage of what Paul said uh, to the church in Corinth about this. He said, the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And this is kind of a key thing, I think, especially for this morning of us thinking about this special time. He says, For whenever you eat and drink this cup, eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We're going to put you know, Mother's Day posts on Facebook. We're going to give cards to mom. We're going to go out and spend time with mom and stuff um, to make sure people know how much we love our mom. And we pause, and Paul, Paul even tells us here that as we pause and celebrate personally the death and resurrection of Jesus, we are proclaiming, we are telling people how much we love Jesus and what he has done for us. So let me pray for us, and then we can share in that. God, we thank you. We thank you that you loved us enough that you would, you would send your son to die in our place, that you would love us so much, that not when we got our lives together, not when we got everything figured out, not when we kind of put the pieces together, but you loved us enough that even in the midst of all the junk of our life, you still sent your son. Even before, even before we were born, even a thought for our families generations and generations ago, you sent him to die for all of us. And God, we are blessed to know that all who receive him, all who choose to follow him, all who put their faith in him can be restored to that right relationship with you. We thank you for that blessing that is Jesus and his death and his resurrection. God, in these moments while we pause and we take this time to remember what he's done for us, may you help us to be, uh, may you help our spirits be renewed in you. May you fill us again with the Holy Spirit. May you just speak to us in this moment, renew our commitment, renew our, our love for you as we celebrate this great uh, act of, of love and grace and mercy to us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Every week we also take time to share prayer requests and share needs and praises. Um, and uh, I always want to remind you that in the, on the back table, we have our basket with some prayer cards. If you'd like to fill one out, you can drop it in there. We'll not only share it here, but we'll also put it on our prayer list. And on the back of your bulletin is our prayer list. And those of you who are, who are worshiping online with us, if you uh, click the prayer tab, and it'll send uh, an email to us in the office so we can get those prayer requests and be praying for you. A uh, couple that I want to share 
one card in there. Uh, it says, please pray for our neighbor, Kathy Adam. She'll be having open heart surgery tomorrow. Um, and this is from Venus and Gary Toller, and you probably, some of you probably know Kathy Adam um, and, and, uh, and Jack, so we're going to be praying for Kathy uh, and her doctors as she's having her surgery tomorrow. Also, I want to be uh, praying for the Delinskys, uh, Bob and Janice. They're not here with us this morning. Bob was feeling kind of sick, and um, I imagine a lot of it has to do with just being run down. Uh, they've been kind of going through a lot over the past several weeks, losing family members, losing close friends that are almost family members in their life. Um, and driving all over the place to have to try and, um, you know, take care of those things. And so a lot on them, so uh, we're pr- we want to be praying for them. I know that they're worshiping with us online, uh, but we want to be praying for them this morning. And then lastly, we also want to be praying for Jessica Robb. Um, she shared with me and shared with others this past week that she's been diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, that's, a, that's a really tough uh, pill to swallow, to, to hear that news. Um, and uh, it's, it's uh, pretty severe. And so we're going to be, uh, you know, really lifting her up and asking God to be with them and to, to help them out. And we'll keep you updated of, of how we can support them and, and love them in the, the several months to come as she goes through uh, surgery next month and then also several months of chemo and radiation. Um, and, and as if that's not bad enough, she also learned that her mother is, was diagnosed with breast cancer as well. And so um, so we want to be praying for all of them that are involved with that. So a lot of stuff uh, very heavy on their hearts, I'm sure. Um, so not only for their physical healing, we need to be praying for their just their, their heart, their emotional, spiritual healing as well. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we thank you for being, for being a loving God, being a loving Father who, uh, who wants to be there for us, who wants to hear from us, who wants to know the things that are on our hearts and the things that stress us out, the things that overwhelm us, the things that hurt us, uh, the things that are difficult in our lives, you want to hear from us. And, and God, we, we bring these things to you, and we bring even other things to you that I know that we're not even mentioned this morning. I know that there are hurts and pains, uh, both in this room and online with us, and there are people that are going through difficulties uh, that need your help, God. And so, Lord, we just pray that you would bless each heart that is struggling today, uh, whether it's physically or emotionally or spiritually, God, would you just would you just step in there and be very present, and may you help us to see personally how we can also step into their to their lives and into their story, and be a support and encouragement for each of them. God, we pray for uh, Kathy and her surgery tomorrow. May you be with her. I'm sure there's a lot of nerves today leading up to it. May you just be with her and watch over her, keep her safe, be with Jack as he has to kind of wait uh, for it and uh, be with the doctors, guide them, help them to use the skills that you have blessed them with um, as they as they perform this surgery tomorrow. God, we pray for the the, the Delinskys, uh, Bob and Janice, and we ask that you would just be with them as I know that they're probably feeling run down. I know that they're feeling uh, just uh, kind of almost out of steam. Would you renew their strength and help them as they continue to minister and love on their family and even those around them that need support and just continue to use them. And God, we also pray for Jessica and her mom as they both received really difficult news of this diagnosis. Would you just uh, bring healing? We just simply ask that, plain and simple, God. We ask for your healing. But God, even more than that, we ask for your, um, we ask you help us to trust in your plan. Help us to trust in your wisdom whatever that may be, God. And I know I, even just sitting and talking with her, it, it just uh, did my heart so good to hear her trusting in you and saying that she knows that you are going to bring them through this no matter what it is and bring her family through this. And I'm so grateful for her faith in you. May you bless her family as they together uh, weather this storm. And may you um, may, maybe even use this, um, as we talked about last week, and use this pain and this struggle to bless someone else eventually um, as, as you're going to bless them. So God, just be with us today. We thank you for our mothers. We thank you for their love. We thank you for their, their leadership and guidance in our lives. May you bless them. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
in 2016, one of my favorite movies came out. Um, I didn't even get to see it in theaters, um, and it wasn't until later on, I think it was like on Netflix, Netflix or whatever, that I finally saw it um, and just absolutely loved the movie Hidden Figures. And it tells the story of the unsung heroes um, of the U.S. space race back in 1961, along with her colleagues Mary Jackson and Dorothy Vaughn, uh, Katherine Johnson, uh, the three of them and so many others worked as what they called at the time computers. They would compute math equations and they would work out the exact math that was used for the launch and re-entry of, pro- of the Mercury project and, and, and worked alongside uh, NASA, worked at NASA as the U.S. raced Russia to outer space. And this movie is kind of, it, in kind of a, an interesting way, it, it holds, I guess, a special place in our hearts around here because it's based out of the Langley NASA facility over in Hampton. But the power of this movie and this story is the fact that African-American women were the ones who stepped to the front to carry the load of the work that made this mission to space and back possible. But for decades, no one really knew the whole story. No one really knew who was really a part of this. Their names, their stories were overlooked, and, and truly, were probably more accurately, they were ignored and neglected. The men of, the, of, of that work, they were the ones who received all the attention. They were the ones who received the credit. Well, today, we kind of start a new series sort of in that same vein. Over the next few weeks today, in the next few weeks, we're going to look at some women in the Bible that really haven't gotten a lot of the top billing, haven't gotten a lot of the attention. Women uh, who did some incredible things for God, who God used to do amazing things and were used in powerful ways. And there's kind of a couple reasons why I wanted us to do this today, obviously starting on Mother's Day, but why I wanted us to to do this series just in general. For one thing, uh, we want women young and old, to see that God can use anyone. Even though a lot of times when we look in Scripture, we see a lot of men's names used uh, throughout Scripture of men being used, there are so many other women who were also used. And not only the ones who were listed on the pages of Scripture, but even the ones who are behind the scenes. And so we want women to know that God can use all of us, young, old, male, and female. But we also, we also want to use this as an opportunity really to kind of jump into some of those parts of God's Word that are sometimes overlooked or run past or not really given much attention to and not taking a lot of time to look at them. And so we're going to be looking at these ladies over the next few weeks. And as a side note, and this isn't really the focus of today, but I feel like I can't kind of walk past this moment without just kind of at least acknowledging the fact that we live in a culture today where many people want to blur the lines of what a man and a woman are. And I think when we do that, we do a disservice both to men and women. You know, in Genesis chapter 1, it tells us that God created them male and female. This was God's plan. This was God's purpose. And I think we should be very leery of when any kind of human takes their opportunity to try and change any of that. But today, as we start in this series, we're going to be looking at a woman, um, for the most part, that I would say most people don't really know much about. And really, though, she was a part of a pretty prominent family in the Old Testament. And this woman is by the name of Rizpah. Now, this, with this being a, a person who is kind of lesser known, and with it being a part of the Old Testament, a lot of times section of the Old Testament we don't always give a lot of attention to, we're going to need to kind of put some context around this. We're going to kind of need to understand where we, where we are before we really jump into Rizpah's story. So in the history of God's people, the Israelites, there came a point when God, um, God's people were just so fractured and divided that even his leaders, God's leaders of his people, were also fractured and divided. Saul was the king of God's people. Saul was the king of Israel. But because of some selfish and ungodly choices that he made, it caused God to not only remove his mantle of leadership from Saul, but even to remove his spirit from Saul. And God then chooses David to be uh, his successor and to lead God's people. But as you can imagine, Saul wasn't too happy about that. And the very fact that David can't take the throne until Saul has died, well, that didn't sit too well with Saul either. And so the civil war breaks out between these two. And there were followers of both kings. There were followers of both men. Uh, and there were situations where they were against each other individually. But then there were also many situations where lots of people were fighting uh, these battles against each other. And we see in Second Samuel, in chapter 3, it said that the, that the war between the house of Saul and David, that they, it lasted a long, long time. And, and part, of, part of the battle 
battle that happened there within this time not only affected them, the two of them, or even their own armies, but it also had effect that kind of stretched beyond them into other parts, and even to those that stretched even beyond Saul's life, far past David and Saul. And we eventually come to 2 Samuel chapter 21, and we see that it says this. It says, during the reign of David, there was a famine for three successive years. So David sought the face of the Lord. The Lord said, it is on account of Saul and his blood-stained house. It is because he put the Gibeonites to death. The king summoned the Gibeonites and spoke to them. Now the Gibeonites were not a part of Israel, but were survivors of the Amorites. The Israelites had sworn to spare them, but Saul in his zeal for Israel and Judah had tried to annihilate them. So let me kind of, let's make sure we get the picture of what's going on here. Uh, A famine has come on the land and David being the leader of God's people, you know, goes to God and seeks out God's wisdom. God, why is this happening in this way? Why why is it happening like this? When are you going to stop this? And God tells David that the reason that this famine, that this drought has come on the land is because of what Saul did to the Gibeonites. And the Gibeonites were these descendants of the Amorites. And when God brought Israel into the promised land and word began to spread that God was blessing these people and that they were able to win battles and take lands, all the different nations around there kind of got scared. And so the Gibeonites decided, hey, we're going to go and try and make a treaty with these people. We're going to try and make sure that they don't attack us. And so they send a delegation to Israel. But when they go, they, they show up in a way, dressed in a way and acting in a way like they didn't have very much money, that they were very poor and that they weren't much of a threat. And they kind of fooled Israel into believing this and made a treaty with them that they would never attack these people. They would never... Um, Uh, start a war with them. But we fast forward to this this feud between Saul and David. And what's happening is that one of the things that Saul hated the most about David was the way that David was seen as this mighty warrior. They would sing songs that Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his tens of thousands. And so Saul, looking for an opportunity to kind of bolster his reputation, I guess, decides to go and attack and even try to completely annihilate this people group. And he wasn't successful. And now Israel is paying for it through this famine, through this drought. And so we pick up now in verse three of 2 Samuel 31. David asked the Gibeonites, what shall I do for you? How shall I make atonement so that you will bless the Lord's inheritance? The Gibeonites answered him, we have no right to demand silver or gold from Saul or his family, nor do we have the right to put anyone in in Israel to death. What do you want to, what do you want me to do for you? David asked. They answered the king, as for the men who destroyed us and plotted against us so that we have been decimated and have no place anywhere in Israel, Let seven of his male descendants be given to us to be killed and their bodies exposed before the Lord at Gibeah of Saul, the Lord's chosen one. So the king said, I will give them to you. So they're suffering this famine. They're suffering this drought all because of Saul's decision, his his evil decision to try and wipe these people out. And David is trying to make things right. He goes to the Gibeonite leaders. He goes to them and says, look, what can I do to make this right? How can I fix this? And they tell him, they say, look, we can't ask you for money. And the one who is responsible for this isn't even alive anymore. We can't put him on trial. You know, we can't sentence him to death. And so they say, instead... What we want you to do is we want you to give us seven of his descendants and we will kill them and we're going to expose their bodies. And David, in a calloused and desperate moment, says yes. And so David, he gives them seven descendants of Saul's and two of them were the sons of the woman we're looking at this morning, Rizpah. The Gibeonites, they do as they said they're going to do. They kill these men and they take their bodies and they put them out in the open and they just expose these dead bodies. And we find in verse 10 now, it says this, Rizpah, the daughter of Ai, took sackcloth and spread it out before herself on a rock. From the beginning of the harvest till the rain poured down from the heavens on the bodies, she did not let the birds touch them by day or the wild animals by night. When David was told that Ai's daughter Rizpah, Saul's concubine, had what, what she had done, he went and took the bones of Saul and his son Jonathan from the citizens of Jabesh Gilead. They had stolen their bodies from the public square at Beth Shan, where the Philistines had hung them before they struck Saul down at Gib- Gib- Gilboa. David brought the bones of Saul and his son Jonathan from there, and the bones of those who had been killed and exposed were gathered up. 
They buried the bones of Saul and his son, Jonathan, in the tomb of Saul's father at Kish, Zela, and Benjamin, and did everything a king had commanded. After that, God answered prayer in behalf of the land. There's a few lessons that I think we can really gain from what Rizpah does in this terrible and awful and callous moment. And, and I think that even though a lot of these lessons that we're going to see this morning really focus in on family and maybe with even within a mother in this specific situation, I think they stretch far beyond that to really all of our relationships. But the first lesson that I think we really can get out of this that I want you to grab is that who we are will not save our children. Who we are, who you and I are, who, who we are, it's not going to save our children, both as parents as grandparents, as siblings, as uh, friends, neighbors, whatever it might be, it will not save our children. Doctors have known for a long time about this idea of genetics, of how characteristics like physical traits, uh, even medical conditions, that these things are passed along from their parents on to children. I mean, even before it was medically proven, it's just kind of known, right? I mean, you can look at families and you're just kind of like, oh yeah, you must be so-and-so's kid, or oh yeah, you must be you know, brother or sister to so-and-so. You can just kind of look at people. There's characteristics like hair color, uh, body shape, even personality traits, even medical conditions sometimes. That's why, you know, a lot of times you go to the doctor, they ask you that long list of have anybody in your family ever this and that, everybody in, in, ever had these things. For me and my family, you know, it's very easy. We, we used to joke um, that you could put my brother and my dad and I in a dark room and just see our silhouettes, and you know it's the Thompson men uh, in there because of our ears and our hair. Um, you you kind of can just tell people in those ways. We joke about our kids. Kids. In so many ways, there are so many different characteristics about my daughter that she is like my little mini me. And there's so many different characteristics about my son that is so much Beth's mini me. But then there's other characteristics that it kind of flip flops, different things that, that kind of connect with it that you just can't deny being a part of that family, both in physical traits, but in personality, in so many ways is true. And in fact, I bet as I'm talking about this, you're probably even thinking about ways within your own family. Maybe you're thinking of characteristics that you share with a parent or a sibling and personality, physical, whatever it might be. But I'm very sorry to say that who we are as parents, who we are as grandparents, aunts, uncles, siblings, it will not save our children. There comes a point where only so much is passed along to our kids. Who you are and what you stand for and who you are committed to, it doesn't always mean something for your kids. I had a deacon one time at a church I worked at. Um, he wanted to schedule a meeting with me. And you know, like it's, it's so funny within the church world of how uh, a lot of times when they'll call one of the people on staff and they want to schedule a meeting, usually what that meeting is all about is I want to go and tell you, you know, give you a piece of my mind about something like that. And that was what one of these, that's what this meeting was all about. This guy came in and he was very frustrated, felt like I wasn't giving his son enough personal attention. Um, and he kind of was telling me all these different examples. And he even said, he said to me, as a deacon of the church, I would have thought that my my son would have gotten special attention. And I was like, whoa, buddy, let's stop right there for a second. But I think sometimes maybe that's kind of how we unintentionally approach things in life, even with God, that we sometimes think, well, I live in such a way or I believe in such a way, surely God will look at my family or my kids like this. But ultimately, each, each one of us, including our kids, will have to give an account for our own lives. In Romans 2, verse 6, it says, God will repay each person according to what they have done. To those who have, by persistence in doing good, seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are, seeking, who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. You see, when it comes to my family, my parents, my brother, my wife, my kids, God doesn't somehow treat them in a certain way just because I'm a pastor, or just because I've committed myself to him, or just because I may try and do my best to honor God with my life. And for Rizpah, even though she may have lived a very noble and maybe a very God-fearing and proper life, it was simply because her kids were the descendants of Saul. That's the reason they were chosen, and they were not shown any kind of special favor. And there is nothing that she could have done to have changed that decision. But we do see that she did do something. 
If we go back to the passage we just, we just read back in verse 10 of, of chapter 21, it says, Rizpah, the daughter of Ai, took a sackcloth and spread it out for herself on the rock from the beginning of the harvest uh, till the rain poured down from the heavens on the bodies. She did not let the birds touch them by the day or the wild animals by, by night. Rizba takes this, this sackcloth, and sackcloth was used a lot of times in moments of mourning and grief in these days. They wanted a physical way to kind of show the heartache and the pain and the struggle that was going on within their, within their heart because of the situations. And so sometimes they would wear it, but here she makes a bed out of it. And not only a bed out of sackcloth, but she puts it on a rock, I mean, a hard place to make it even worse. And she spends day and night, probably for months, fighting off wild animals just to protect the dead bodies of her sons and the others there. These men, uh, some of the translations say that they were hung up. Some of them say that they were actually, some people in tradition believe that they were actually crucified up there. But whatever it might have been, they were exposed to the elements and to the animals. You see, the Gibeonites, they wanted to make a spectacle of these men. And it's kind of what we do sometimes, right? When, when people hurt us, we want them to hurt in the same way. And that's kind of what they were trying to do here. They wanted Israel to hurt in the same way that they had been hurt. But this mom, she wasn't having any of it. She couldn't stop them being killed, but she was not going to allow their bodies to be picked apart or ripped apart by animals. And while she couldn't have stopped them from being killed, she shows us this next important lesson that we do what we can do for our family. There are some things that we just cannot stop. There are some things that we cannot do, but we do what we can do for our family. Because again, you can't save your kids. You can't save your spouse. You can't save any of your friends. You can't save any of your neighbors, your coworkers, your relatives, whatever it might be. But there are other things that you can do. And specifically, as you think about within your own family, even for those of you who have kids or grandkids or whatever it might be, uh, children within your home, we read a really powerful passage in the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 6, where God kind of gives some special instruction to his people. In fact, later on, if you go to the book of Matthew or the Gospels, there's a couple times where it's recorded that Jesus says this passage we're going to look at is the most important thing. But then we're also kind of given some more instruction of what they're supposed to do with this most important thing. So it says this in Deuteronomy 6, 4. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. So that's the part that we know that Jesus told us this is the first and greatest commandment. But then it's followed up with this. These commandments that I give to you are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk, talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when, when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. God tells Israel that this is how they're to live, that they're to live lives that, that love God, that honor God above everything else with all that they have, their heart, soul, mind, strength, everything. But then they're also supposed to be intentional about the way that they impart this important truth to their family. It says to impress it on their children, to talk about it when they're at home. You know, when you're at home, to have conversations about God and who he is and what he's supposed to be for us in our life. It says when you walk along, when you go places, maybe for us translated, when you're in the car and you're riding along, to talk about it. It says when you lie down, in other words, at the end of your day, when you're finishing off your day, to talk about God and his goodness and who he is. When you get up, when you start the day, to talk about God. It even says to, to tie them on your hands and to put them on your foreheads, right? That's a perfect thing for Mother's Day. My mom always said she was going to write it on my forehead so I didn't forget it because I would always, I still forget things. But God's word tells us it's so important to even tie them on our hands and our foreheads. It even says to write them on your door frames and your gates so that as people leave your home and come back in, they understand what is important. Friends, we can't save our family, but you can do what you can do. And so parents, you have to forgive me, but I'm going to get a little preachy here for just a minute. You know, in the 12 years that I spent before in student ministry, and I'm probably in the more than 21 years of ministry that I've, that I've spent, I have seen way too many kids leave their home and leave their faith. And again, you and I, we can't save our kids. We can't make our kids believe. But so many times, these same kids who walk away from their faith, 
They walk away from their families who it just make it an afterthought for them. And it would always blow my mind because I would see these parents who were so committed to the Lord and so committed to growing their own faith and walking with the Lord in every part of their life. And it was so important to them, but it was such an afterthought for their children. And then they would get so frustrated when their kids would move away, go off to college, start their own family and decide not to follow in their same kind of faith footsteps. And I'm not saying you have to lock a kid in a box and only let them out to go to church and only listen to Caleb and just, you know, only do those kinds of things. But what I am saying is that sometimes as parents, we have to be parents. And that means sometimes saying no to our kids and sometimes even saying no for our kids. But that also means even saying yes to our kids and even yes for our kids. That sometimes means saying no to the people that our kids want to be around so badly. That means sometimes saying no to spending time with those people that our kids so badly want to be around and hang out with. But it also means sometimes saying yes to those things that we know will be so good and beneficial for our kids that they need to be a part of. In Proverbs 22, 6, it's written, it says, start, a ch- start children off on the way they should go, and even when they are old, they will not turn from it. Because we are their parents, one day, they will be gone from our home, right? I mean, that's kind of like, it's sad to say, but that's sort of the goal of parenting is to make sure that once they walk out from our home, that they survive on their own, right? That's what it was for you as you grew up, that your parents were supposed to raise you in a way that when you leave, that's how you leave and you can make it on your own. And yes, there'll be times that our kids will be upset and frustrated with us, but that's okay because God never called us to be our kids' best friends. And the truth is, Even if we were their best friends, there are many things that we say yes to that we should be saying no to. And even a true friend calls someone out on the junk and the crud in their life. And so you do what you can do. No matter how much it hurts you or them, no matter how small it may seem, how measly it may seem, you do, no matter what it takes, you do what you can do for your kids so that they can know and follow God. Now, those of you who maybe have kids who are grown up, maybe you're thinking, well, that's not me, and I'm not a part of that anymore. You know, it's, they've moved out, and I've kind of, my opportunity is over with, but you still do what you can do for those kids. Maybe you don't have kids at home. Maybe, maybe you have nieces and nephews. Maybe you are a grandparent or whatever. You still have influence on these kids. You do what you can do. And that might mean simply praying for them every day. That might mean, reminding them. That might mean nagging them or encouraging them when you can do it. But ultimately, it's trusting God. It's trusting Him to watch over and care for them. You do what you can do. But the other thing that I want us to catch is sort of the result of all this of what Rizpah did for these, these men um, David, he gets word of what Rizpah is doing and this incredible things. He's out there protecting these bodies. And, and when David hears about what Rizpah is doing, we pick up now in verse 13, we see what he does. David brought the bones of Saul and his son, Jonathan, from there. The bones of those who were killed and exposed were gathered up. You see, David hears about what Rizpah is out there doing. And, and no doubt, he finally like comes to his senses and realizes that what he had done was wrong. And he should not have done this. And so he gathers the bones of Saul. He gathers the bones of Jonathan and these other men who are out there. And he probably buries them. He properly buries them. And then the result of him making things right is that God begins to answer the prayers and the drought is over. Remember it said that Rizpah was out there, um, out there until the rain had started to fall again. You see, the whole reason that David even did this, the whole reason David took this step of going and making things right was because of this mother who was out there protecting these bodies. You see, sometimes we can feel like what we're doing isn't accomplishing much. Sometimes we can feel like maybe as parents, you know, we're just kind of doing and doing and doing and we're sacrificing and sacrificing. It's just like, what's it all for? It's just not making a difference. And I'm sure Rizba, maybe for her, maybe in the moment when she started this, maybe at first she thought, I'll go out and protect these bodies for a little bit and David will come to his senses and, and take them down and bury them. And then days turned into weeks and then weeks turned into months for her. And even though she protected them from the animals, I mean, decay was going to come on these bodies no matter what. She wasn't going to be able to protect them for that, from that. 
And there are times that you and I, that we step in to our, we step in for our families and we make hard decisions. And maybe we get some blowback about those decisions. Maybe we get blowback from our kids about it. Like, why are we doing this? Or why aren't we doing this? Maybe we get the blowback from maybe other family members within our family who aren't happy of what we're choosing to do. Maybe from siblings or from our community or even just from our culture. And maybe it's like we're like Rizbo, where we're feeling like we're constantly fighting off the wild beast, trying to attack our family. And we feel like there's just one thing after another, after another, and we feel like it's just never going to end. But you stick with it. And, and I don't know what kind of things may come along in your life, and I don't know how it may happen in your life, but we continue over and over and we stick with it. Because again, it's not always about what we do. It's sometimes it's about the choices that they're going to make. But I think in the end, what a powerful thing not only meant for Rizpah and what, what, uh, what people saw of her doing is the effect that it had on people around them. You see, our faithfulness to our family can affect others. In the same way that Rizpah being faithful to these men, these boys of hers and the others, it affected David. And I think the same thing is true for us, that when people see our faithfulness of us fighting for our own family, it can have a powerful effect on others around. You know, there's a lot of what's called parent shaming going on in our culture today through social media, where maybe maybe people, and, and I think parent shaming can happen like internally, where maybe people will see things on social media, or they hear about things, and it's not meant to shame people, but they feel like, I'm a terrible parent. You know, like you see somebody and they make their, I've seen the, the videos of these people who make like the, the, the perfect little lunch and it's all like, it looks like it's, you know, like a platter for a wedding. And then for me, I'm over there slapping the peanut butter on Brennan's sandwich, his peanut butter and honey sandwich. I'm putting the Ziploc, you're good to go, buddy. You know, some people could take that and feel like, oh, I'm such a terrible parent. Or sometimes people will intentionally do these kinds of things to sort of build themselves up. And they'll share these stories, they'll post these pictures, they'll, they'll do these things to parent shame. And that's not what this is about. That's not at all what this is about. But what this is, is about is us setting the example of us taking those difficult steps by leading by example, by stepping into those moments. And there are so many different moments, and you can, you can choose your own moment. I'm sure maybe some that pop to mind of those moments where you have to step in for your family and do something. But we lead by example, and who knows who knows what's going to happen when others hear of and see the example that we are setting of taking those difficult steps, of doing those difficult things, of making those difficult decisions for our families. Paul encouraged this in so many ways of setting this example. He even said in 1 Corinthians 11, he said, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. And I think that's the perfect kind of humility for us to have, that it's not about follow my example, period. No, it's about follow my example as I follow the examples before me. And maybe your example was your parents. Maybe your example is someone else in your community that you look at and you think, that's, that's right. That's what I need to do. That's how I need to be running after. That we should, we should have that same kind of goal to recognize that we don't all have it figured out, but we follow Christ. And together, we're going to take one step at a time and head in the right direction. And when you and I, when we stand and we fight for our families like Rizpah did, I think not only does it have effect on families around us, and I think not only does it encourage and inspire other families, but most importantly, God will see what we are doing. And I believe that he will bless us just as he did with the people because of Rizpah's faithfulness. God will bless you and your family and even those people around you when you are faithfully leading and loving your families. So make that your goal. You know, maybe on this Mother's Day today, whether you're a mother or a father, or you have children at home or moved out, or it's not your story at all, maybe you don't have any children, maybe you have influence in other ways. Together, we can do what we can do for our children, and that should be our goal, to recognize we can't do it all, but we're going to do what we can do for our families, just like Rizpah did. Let me pray for us. God, we thank you for the people in our lives, our parents, the people who had a strong influence in our family, in our lives, maybe not even family members, maybe, maybe friends or, or neighbors or adoptive parents or adoptive aunts and uncles, whatever it might be, God, there's so many people in our lives that have stepped in and, and sometimes 
made the difficult and messy decisions or taken the difficult and, and, and messy steps in our lives. God, I pray that we would, we would follow suit with that, that we would be willing to fight for our families and to do what we can do, even if it seems small, even if it seems insignificant, even if it seems like it really doesn't matter in the long run. But God, we, could do, we do what we can do, just like Rizpah did. God, I thank you for her faithfulness to her family. I thank you for her example. I thank you for your word as it gives us this truth, as it gives us her example. God, may we take it to heart today. May we find those difficult things that we need to do. And God, I pray for the young people within this church family. I pray for the young people within this community. God, I pray that you would, you would be with them, God, that you would walk alongside them. And we need you, God. We need you to protect our young people, our kids. We need you to be with them and to guide them and help them to make, make wise choices to take wise steps to move in wise ways that would bring not just safety and pleasure to them but would bring honor and glory to you so god be with them and help us to do what we can do to set the stage for that we pray all this in jesus name amen, amen. our King. Come, let's bow at His feet. He has done great things. Yes, He has. Come, what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great the grave you free 
every captive and break every chain oh god you have done great things we dance in your freedom awake and alive oh jesus our savior your name is in high oh god you have done great things Have a good Mother's Day. Thank you. Thank you.